How should we like it were stars to burn? With a passion for us, we could not return. If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. The Interplanetary Podcast. The exploration of space for the benefit of all mankind. Your hosts here in London, Matthew Russell and Jamie Franklin. Oh, yeah, baby Valentines. Valentines. Happy Valentine's Day, listeners. Our listeners will always be our Valentines. Oh, they're the ones. I mean, sure, I love Europa, but have you seen our listeners? Hello. (laughs) (laughs) Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. And if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. (laughs) Luther Vandross. I love Vandross. He's my favourite alien. Love him. I'm a bit upset, but I don't need to be, do I, about the the Mars rover mission. Yes, no more opportunities for contact. That's it. Gone. NASA no longer going to attempt to contact. Well, Matt, do you know what? Obama put up a lovely message on Instagram saying that we needn't be sad. Let's look at all the work that was done. I mean, I genuinely would spin this that NASA's Uh, declare it that Mars rover mission is complete. Right, I agreed. It's got to come to a conclusion at some point. It does. And now they can spend some money on the next generation of rovers. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it'll be like when I'm, I don't know, I I always thought I'd die at 76 years old when you're pushing me around in much better health. (laughs) And, you know, I'll still be able to bang out one more podcast and then that's it. Throw me into the fire, scatter my ashes on Europa. Job done. And then we can say the interplanetary podcast mission is, yeah, was is complete. complete. Yeah, exactly. And no one will shed a single tear for Jamie Franklin, knowing that he li- lived his life to the max. Exactly. There'll be waving flags in the street <laughs> if I know Hove. Um, so I think we should go down the list, Matt, and give people some statisticians uh, of <laughs> what the rover completed. Okay, well... Yes, of course, we're talking about Opportunity Rover or MERB, Mars Exploration Rover B. Big Merb. It arrived at the Red Planet at 12,000 miles an hour late in January 2004. That's quick. It is quick, isn't it? Parachutes and airbags into Meridiani Planum. Yes, that parachutes and, and airbag system was really, really cool, wasn't it? That that whole thing of slowing down through the atmosphere and then deploying lots of different parachutes, then blowing up these massive airbags and then landing and that the airbags sort of all falling away and then the rover driving off its little platform. It's a beautiful it's thing. almost a miracle. So that was three weeks after the twin Spirit, which is M-E-R-A, if anyone was wondering, 185 kilograms of rover twin spirit that sounds like a nice cocktail doesn't it the mission was to last 90 souls or matt in our terms that's 92.5 days but it actually lasted 5351 souls well i'd say it's more than complete that is exactly yeah i mean it's completely smashed it hasn't it by orders of magnitude so matt what do you reckon the cost of it was well i actually know the answer to this because i saw a very good tweet by Casey Dreyer from the Planetary Society, yeah. which summed it up. So it was just over one billion in total. And actually, even though that sounds like a lot to us, that's considered pretty cheap in the end, considering all things. Yeah, well, that's 14 years of some of the most monumental discoveries. Martian First service. Rover to really say, yes, there was definitely liquid water on the planet. I mean, if you take the same amount, you spent about a billion pound on your platinum covered drones, haven't you? Yeah, and you've spent about uh, a million pounds on your beard trimming products <laughs> and Cuban high heels <laughs> and snake hips belts. Oh, you can't have enough of them. So twenty eight <laughs> miles. It covered twenty eight miles. Matt, that's two miles more than a marathon. You're supposed to do something like four kilometers or something. This next one I love. Mm-hmm. Launch patch features Duck Rogers, Daffy Duck. Red Planet Gladiators. It sounds like that. If you just read that sentence as it is, it sounds like I've had a bit of a mental breakdown. I'm sort of malfunctioning, doesn't it? 
Mm. But uh, tell us some of the uh, tell us some of the little way stations that it's passed. Okay, here we go. Eagle Crater, Endurance Crater, Victoria Crater, Marathon Valley on the edge of the huge Endeavour Crater. What's your favourite? It? What's your favourite crater, Matt? It's got to be. It's got to be Eagle, isn't it? Uh, I think Endeavour is my favourite crater because it yeah. is huge, and obviously some of the pictures as it's at Marathon Valley are just stunning. Why are you always about size? <laughs> uh, because I've got an affinity to size. I'm not scared about size, Jamie. <laughs> That's so creepy. Uh, so the rover was already suffering from amnesia problems with its arm. Mm. It's basically stumbling around on Mars like an old man, a poor old man. So, yes, unfortunately, 10th of June 2018... During that last global dust storm, that was the last anyone heard from poor old Opportunity. Oh, so f- it found a rock by its heat shield that was to be the first meteorite discovered on Mars. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and it was the first ever to take a selfie on the red planet. You love a selfie stick, don't you? Spirit sound, uh, landed one side of Mars. And Opportunity landed on the other side of Mars, so both sides covered. Mm. Uh, and Curiosity was on the opposite side to Opportunity. So now Opportunity's gone and Spirit has gone, of course. Um, that's it. Curiosity remains alone. So two th- since 2004, we've had a presence on, the, on Mars, rover presence on Mars. Uh, so... Now, curiosity, that's pretty stressful, isn't it? He's got curiosity to keep trundling along until at least 2020 when uh, Mars 2020 and ExoMars, of course, are all going to be landing down. Franklin, the big time rover named after the podcast host. Keep it in the family, you know. Why did they spell Jamie R O S A L I N D? <laughs> it is weird. I mean, I'll take the surname, so uh, I'll, I'll forgo that mistake. That's some honor, Jamie. You must have been well chuffed. Yeah, I mean, I just take it all in my stride, um, you mm. know, in the knowledge that I'm a f- legend. Yeah, uh, yeah. Matt, so I was wondering, uh, and I don't know the answer to this, by the way, but how long would it take for Curiosity to crawl over to the other side of Mars and bump into one of the other two that are its decaying friends? There you go. There's a question for our listeners. So if you think you know the answer, why don't you write in? Yeah. Do you reckon if Curiosity found uh, opportunity that it would make that noise that R2-D2 makes when it's sad, you know? I think we're back to Eve, Eve and Worley. Eva. It's very sad. Very sad indeed. So, Matt. Yes. In more news. Well, according to a, a Defence Intelligence Agency report, the US could come under attack from space. Right. So in the report, it actually says, having seen the benefits of space-enabled operations, some foreign governments are developing capabilities that threaten others' ability to use space. China and Russia, in particular, have taken steps to challenge the United States and are developing new space weapons. Sounds a bit sci-fi. These are the scary ones. Directed energy weapons. Ooh. Well, Matt, there's there's only one thing for it. Space Force. That's the Space Force. (laughs) Kind of. Here's the weirdest one of the week. The Pentagon have decided to review Elon Musk's SpaceX getting certification for their Falcon Heavy for military payloads. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, well, SpaceX, they're not quite sure where it's come from, but it's an extra kick in the teeth because... When the last procurement for NASA went through when they were looking for the next generation of rockets, Hmm. um, ULA, uh, Northrop Grumman, and uh, Blue Origin all received loads of money, in fact, $2.2 billion, and SpaceX didn't. And and the thinking was that SpaceX already had Falcon Heavy certified, so they didn't really need it. They'd already developed a rocket system. Right. There was a few complaints that SpaceX didn't get any money, so... Those complaints went through, and maybe this is some form of retaliation for that. I think you're right. It seems all a little bit harsh. They they actually must be quite worried in the in the old SpaceX office about that because that's that's a big revenue earner for them. I'd love to be a fly on the wall 
And in other news as well, another big procurement thing that's coming up. Here we go. This is actually genuinely really exciting. And actually, it's the first time I've actually felt positive, really, about the Lunar Gateway. Here we go. Tell me. So, yeah, NASA have released their broad agency announcement asking the US aerospace industry for its help to develop large landers as early, get this, as 2028 yeah, to carry that's astronauts to the awesome. surface of the moon. Yeah, I mean, you haven't been the biggest fan of the, the Gateway, but this is big news. Yeah, it really is, actually. I think this is, this is bigger news than probably the press had us that have kind of reported it. Because that, so the agency it, expects to send people back to the moon with what it calls, and I quote, a human landing system. I like that. HLS. Well, HLS. Sort of goes with S- SLS, HLS. So what's phase A going to be? So NASA's going to hand out $300,000 to $9 million um, rewards and awards for people who are putting up these various ideas for one or all three of the following elements. Here we so go. So a, a transfer vehicle, which obviously carries this uh, lander, well, descent and ascent vehicle, into lunar orbit from the lunar gateway. Ah, uh, yeah. So you, so you go from the lunar gateway into a, into a different lunar orbit ready for landing. So that's your Got transfer it. vehicle. Then yeah. you have your dis- descent vehicle which actually lands on the surface of the moon. And then you've got your ascent vehicle, which is part of that descent vehicle that comes back up again, just like the Apollo missions. And uh, so, so, yeah, there's loads of money up for grabs to develop that. And then a few companies, or maybe one or two, will be picked to receive hundreds of millions of dollars um, to develop those systems. And those companies that are picked are expected to put up another sort of 20% of their money as part do you of think, pri- uh, private-public partnership. Do you think, uh, if you were a betting man, Matthew, what, mm-hmm. would, what, what do you reckon that the Interplanetary Podcast will receive, 300 grand or 9 million? I think if we put in a decent enough bid, it should be the full 9 million. Well, I don't see why not. Exactly. So, um, and if so, and that that goes out to the listeners as well. If um, if you're a patron, you'll uh, and you're part of our team, and we yeah. develop something nice, then obviously you take a, a share of that nine million as we develop our lunar lander systems. Well, I think we should start uh, tweeting your local Congress uh, man or woman, and uh, you know, putting our case forward. Now, Jamie, I would have to say all this new attention on the moon. Mm. And essentially, Mars being completely now forgotten about. Because even oh. SpaceX, by the way, are going to put forward a bid for this uh, lunar lander. Of course land. they are. Well, what's really weird, I'm not sure of course they are, is actually uh, is not necessarily true. Because, of course, they're designing Starship, which, isn't, which wouldn't be part of this system. The lunar lander in this system would be part of the Gateway and SLS and all that. So it would have to be a completely different design to their Starship. So SpaceX obviously could get to the moon using their Starship system, and that's kind of what they've been saying. But it is. I wish everybody good luck. This is exciting news. Everyone's gone moon crazy, which means that the whole Mars thing is a complete no, no non-starter now. Which which leads me on to my next story, Jamie. And 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 in some ways, I think it's good riddance to slightly bad rubbish. Really, here we go. Is the death of Mars One. The company oh. Mars One. Now, that apparently Mars One Foundation is still going, so it's the commercial arm that has uh, gone bankrupt. But uh, yes, thankfully, Mars One is dead and not the ridiculous bunch of people that may have all lost their lives in a hideous manner going to Mars to record a reality TV show. Absolutely. I think we should get back to reality. Uh, there's one more piece of space news that I've stuck in the wrong place, Jamie. Oh, go on. And that is the ludicrous Ultima Thule shocker. Oh, yes. This is actually amazing. So This is big. And it's a really good optical illusion as well. What we perceived as a snowman with our eyes when we saw that picture, when yeah. the Ultima Thule picture came back, we kind of just uh, we were deceived into thinking they were spherical bodies touching each other. And so it looked like a snowman. But 
thankfully, um, New Horizons, as it whizzed by, took a, took a photo facing backwards and had captured the crescent of Ultima Thule. Mm. The scientists have been able to re- work out the shape of the object due to the way that it's obscuring stars in these several shots. And it turns out that Ultima Thule is more pancake and walnut shaped. Yeah, they're a bit more pebble-like, aren't they? Yeah, well, they're like skimming pebbles. I was just going to say exactly yeah. that. I love a good skim. Yeah, there's a great beach from where I am to do a bit of skimming. Oh, in fact, it's, just it's down the road from me. I, get, I got seven the other day, seven in a row. Twelve I got in the other day. What? In front of my In front of my kids, they were very impressed. I call bullshit. I'm going to have to <laughs> no, talk to him. No, I, I, I am blooming good at du- We call it ducks and drakes. Ducks and drakes. Interesting. Ducks and drakes, yeah. Okay. yeah. So these yeah. objects are really strange. It's nothing like Churi Amov, Cherry Semenko. Never really seen objects like this. And that on the, on the, on the sort of tail of Pumuamua, which is also bizarrely shaped. So maybe bizarre shaped objects are the thing. I just think it's 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 very on vogue to be bizarre a, a bizarre shaped object in the universe. You know, I am definitely one. Uh, Jamie, yeah, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do a space word of the week to introduce our special today, which is all about orbex. Is it space words of the week again? It, oh. it is a bit. It is a bit space words of the week. Sorry, space words of the week is small sat launcher what is a small sat launcher or a small lift orbital launch vehicle i'll tell you what it is it's beautiful it's be- they are beautiful because we stood next to an engineering prototype didn't we jamie this week it, it it kind of blew our minds uh just to see it and then it blew our minds again when we were told that it was the biggest 3d printed engine ever Right, so yes, a small lift orbital launch vehicle, anything up to two tonnes to low Earth orbit. First example being Korolov's Sputnik rocket that took up Sputnik, of course. Uh, yes. And then the Vanguard rocket by the USA. And uh-huh. that obviously kickstart the space race. The UK have got a bit of a heritage in this. We had the Black Arrow, which carried 73 kilograms to low Earth orbit. That's right. Of which Sky Rora are using very similar technology to the Black Arrow. Ariane's Vega is also a small lift rocket, but it's 10 times the lift of Orbex. Oof. So this is what the CEO of Alekna Demos, one of the partners and customers, Miguel Belo Mora, said, I'm looking forward to this Spanish accent. Off you go, Matt. Despite this being the first time that most people have heard of Orbex, They have quietly and diligently reached a point where they are arguably already leading European Space Launch Company. (laughs) It sounded one of the, like, uh, three amigos. I liked it. So, yeah, there's there's a few on the market at the moment. There's, uh, There's Vector, which are still in development phase. In China, we have a similar rocket in one space there, OSM1. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's uh, Rocket Labs Electron, and that's I think is the that's the one that's leading the pack at the moment. That's the daddy. Yeah, that is the daddy, isn't it? iSpace have got the Hyperbola one, mm-hmm. and Landspace, another Chinese one like iSpace, the Zook one. So quite a few, and of course Spain have the Miura five, which used to be called the Ariane. <laughs> or two or something. C. It's worth noting, actually, that we, we mentioned Firefly, but Firefly used to be in this category of sort of 200 to 400 kilograms to get into mm. space. But they've decided to go They've decided to go a little bit heavier. They've decided to move out of that area and be about five times bigger, about a tonne into space. Mm. And they reckon they can get it to $15,000 a kilogram compared to Rocket Lab's uh, twenty five thousand dollars per kilogram that's a big deal yeah so firefly have kind of stepped out of that market and if you want to read a brilliant article about firefly you should check out eric berger's article that he did on ars technica go uh, check la- our man week. eric it, it's really it's really good anyway so i'm going to compare quickly orbex to electron right you better so, so orbex is 19 meters in height Whereas Electron is 17 meters in height, so it's a, it's a couple of meters taller. 
diameter is slightly bigger as well. It's 10 centimeter bigger diameter, 1.3 instead of 1.2. Hmm. And, and it's considerably heavier, 18,000 18, kilograms, whereas your mass of your electron is 12,500 kilograms. Now, obviously, the electron details are a lot, are a lot more in stone because of course it's actually flying whereas the orbex one these are still guesstimates but they carry a similar payload up into space this is exciting isn't it yeah now the interesting thing about electron of course is that they've said that they're looking at launching from sutherland spaceport as well sutherland being this scottish Ah, spaceport so they're looking well so they 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 could of course be um there on uh, as competitors right on the same uh, spaceport whereas um orbex look like they're trying to launch from sutherland spaceport and the azores but it's worth noting that neither the sutherland spaceport or the azores spaceport actually have full planning permission i was yet. just going to say it's not confirmed yet they seem very confident they uh, do everyone seem very in confident. forest seems uh, apart yeah. from a few locals seem very very happy that this is obviously going to put them on the map and bring lots of money, needed money, mm. uh, to the area. We heard about schools closing and, uh, you know, not many jobs in the area. I think this is this is going to be a great thing, especially considering that it's going to be about six launches a year. Um, I think, you know, why wouldn't you want that? The largest 3D printed engine, mm. and that was done by a company called SLM, on their SLM 800, they reckon that that cuts down on 90% turnaround time. So it actually is a much quicker process and 50% saving in costs. Where do I sign? Well, you can sign on the dotted line. Sign on the Cali gas tank. Love it. Yeah, that is, that is cool, isn't it? The fact that the whole thing runs on Cali gas. We both got nostalgic, didn't we? Our childhood barbecues are now powering... Small satellite launches. Jamie, shall we just have a listen to uh, Chris Lamour's interview and then we'll play Graham Turnick. I don't want to wait any longer because this interview was one of my favourites of the last few years. It was really good, wasn't it? Let's roll the tape. So, Akute. The Interplanetary Podcast, putting the ace back into space. Okay, well, we're here with Chris Lamour. Uh CEO of Orbex, thank you for inviting us to your beautiful new facility. How are you? I am having a long evening. <laughs> I bet you are. How are you feeling? I'm sure you're feeling better now your species um, are done. Actually, I wasn't nervous at all today because, you know, we, we live with that thing you saw earlier um, day by day. So for us, it's quite sort of commonplace. I was more nervous really about the food tonight than I was about the space stuff. And how hard has it been to keep that secret for such a long time? Well, always, we keep things fairly quiet anyway. You know, we, we quite often tweet pictures of sofas and, you know, carpet tiles rather than the rocket technology. But actually that's been a big help to the company because it, we are working quite hard behind the scenes on real space hardware, as you saw earlier. And, um, we get a lot of, uh, support and credibility from an awful lot of people that were in that room tonight for, by, by keeping quiet about that and working seriously. So actually, the, the keeping quiet thing is, it's not that we're super secretive, it's just we just don't think what we're working on is super interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I know that sounds weird, but we it's do. true. Yeah, yeah, um, it's... We're a very low ego company, honestly. You know, there's no sort of, I mean, I, I happen to be speaking to you tonight because it's my job, but I, I would prefer not to be too perfectly honest. Sure, sure. <laughs> we understand. <laughs> but... I, the one thing we, we, we've noticed and uh, since Farnborough, since, since we first heard about you, we literally was after that Farnborough announcement, is what is it that you've got that's, that's special that's allowed all this kind of very big investment to come your way? What, 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 it, what do you think it is that, yeah. that is the, the, I guess, the, the magic moment, the killer app that Orbex has? Yeah, so or, quite often in this sector, you get enthusiasts who want to build a rocket and they miss a few of the key ingredients in building a business. Now, I I come at this as someone who, I've never even been to a live engine test so far in the history. We've been firing engines for two years, I've never been to one, because I would be a distraction for the engineers, and honestly, I've got more important things to do in terms of fundraising and stuff like that than watching an engine test. I can watch the video. Um, So what what is the secret of the company? We we have uh, three types of people in this company. We have um, people with a pedigree in really hardcore uh, European Space Engineering and RM5, RM6. We hired away 
one of the turbo engineers from Ariane 6 recently and one of the software engineers from Ariane 6, they were probably pretty unhappy about that, but you know. <laughs> um, uh, the other the other group of people is people who've built rockets with their own hands. Uh, some of them come out of the Copenhagen Suborbitals program. Now, um, they're, it's an amateur effort, but the skills that they've developed, the kind of fingertip knowledge that they've developed is really, really useful on a practical, everyday basis because they've failed several times to build rockets and they know what doesn't work. And that's half the battle. That's what gives us pace. We know how to translate this, the kind of the brain power of the... Uh, the designers into pragmatic solutions that fit and work in the real world. And then you have people like me and the board members who know how to raise money because I built, helped build and sell five companies already. And one of my board members was has early shares in Spotify. So he did very well out of that last year. <laughs> Not bad. Um, you know, and, and other people like that who understand the commercial aspect of the company. So we've got this kind of these three legs to the stool, the, 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 the brain power, the kind of the, the, the muscle power, and then the kind of exploitative <laughs> um, commercial arm. And, and I think that's very rare that you get those three things in a company uh, in this sector. And, and in fact, I think a lot of, my, my personal view is a lot of um, space sector companies fail because you end up with only two out of those three. You have a marketing guy who wants to build a rocket or you have a rocket guy who wants to build a rocket and, and they never meet each other. Um, in this company, we're quite fortunate that we have those three elements. I think that is our secret sauce, if you want right, to. Yeah. And what would you say over the next... 10 years your main goals here? Well, I'd like to get that rocket to orbit. That's my number one goal right now. Beyond that, I've, I couldn't tell you, honestly. It's the only goal we have is to get that rocket to orbit. And, and, a, time, and a timeline for that? Well, we want to launch late 2021. Um, I don't know when we'll actually achieve orbit. I mean, I, I think this, this sector is littered with, <laughs> with people making predictions of when they're going to launch. So I guarantee you, whatever I say, I'll be wrong. Guarantee it. Um, but you know, uh, we fully expect some failure along the way. That's for sure. I just hope it's not sort of super embarrassing failure. You know, yep. that's that's the main goal <laughs> from my point of view, from the PR point of view, right? Yeah, sure. But the engineers are, are, are. I think one of the the kind of the things that we see when we go and meet people, when we raise money or we go to grant committees and stuff, the technical team is mega credible, and there is no doubt when you meet those people that you know exactly what they're doing. Perhaps you get a time with, later on with the CTO, Jonas. Um, you know. There's no arguing with that guy. He has 50 spacecraft out there right now with his hardware on it. What 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 domain expertise does a venture capitalist have to tell him he's wrong? Yeah, yeah it's, it's very hard to argue. Um, and so I think th those kind of skills and capabilities come together, and and uh, we deliver. We deliver on our promises. When we say we're going to deliver on a milestone, we we pretty much always deliver on time. And that's why we won that backing from the UK Space Agency last year when everybody went Lockheed Martin and who. Right, yeah. that moment. I mean, I'm not surprised because you know, who was Orbex and yeah. still is now. We're still an early stage young company, and we could very easily fail. Right, I mean, we're all aware of that risk. Yeah, but today's put a big stamp on that to say we're here, we're serious, yeah. and you need to think of us as a big player in this industry. I mean, the rocket alone is amazing. Would you be able to go into a bit more detail about the 3D printing mm -hmm. and the biopropane? Yeah. So, I mean, <clears throat> if you think about this all started really about thinking about the, the problem of micro launches, which is they're quite heavy as a class. And that's driven by the square cube law of the surface area of the, um, the structure and the volume it contains. The bigger you get, the more efficient you are. And conversely, as you get smaller, the less efficient you are. A, we actually got a nice graph with a line showing like, you know, uh, Saturn spot. V and Falcon <laughs> 9 and us, right? <laughs> so um, we were looking for ways to kind of get rid of that mass challenge, to reduce the mass so that we get the performance up. And propane is the way we do that. Propane has a unique property, which is that it doesn't freeze when you chill it to the same temperature as liquid oxygen. So what we've developed is a coaxial tank where you have a, a, a propane tank contained within a jacket of LOX. And that's, that's the format. You have this coaxial tanking structure. So you do away with, the, with one of the cryogenic systems. You use the LOX to chill the propane directly. You, you don't need a very strong inner tank. In fact, you want a, 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 as minimal tank as possible to allow heat transfer. Um, so that, that drives a lot of mass out in terms of insulation, the tank structure itself, the, the piping between the various stages, an interstage, insulation mass, all kinds of stuff go away from that. You can also gather all of the connections directly at the bottom of the tanks in one place. You don't need to pipe them around and through and over. It's there, right at the engine immediately. If you look at the engine, you can see it. Um, and then in terms of the characteristics of propane, when you chill it, it, it densifies. Mm. And actually, uh, at that stage, it's about 2% more powerful than RP1. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. volumetrically, it's two percent better than RP one. It's not much, but it, yeah, it's at least as good. Yeah. Um, so that's good. And then it gives us other benefits in terms of building the turbo pump. We can run a very low temperature turbo pump. It's about half the temperature of a standard turbo pump which allows us to use um, materials that are of a lower grade, almost automotive quality. We can certainly 3D print them. Hmm. Um, and we can do it in a way that's more cost effective, it's more reliable, it's not, there's not some high stress or, or high thermal gradients across shafts and things like that. So it becomes more doable for a company of this size. And there are other benefits, like propane is non-coking. Um, and our supplier, uh, Calor, we announced with, with Calor today, they're supplying us with clean propane. It's not, not, no stenchants in it, no butane in it. And that means it's definitely non-coking, so the engines will be reusable if we recover them, when we recover them, yeah. if, when yeah, we recover them. I was going to get onto that one. <laughs> yeah, we'll come to that in a minute, yeah. but yeah. Um, the, the plan is to recover them, because they're a significant chunk of the, the cost of a launcher. Yeah. So if we can get them back and clean, and, and, and with no dents in them, yeah. <laughs> that would be actually quite good to do, and we have a plan to do that. So there's a lot of benefits to propane, um, and, and you only get to that solution by thinking like, what's wrong with the current solution? What, how can we do it differently that actually helps us? And I think that, that drives a lot of things in, in Orbex. And people think we take risks uh, on the tech, and actually we, we really don't. We're just, I th it looks like a rocket. Yeah. It, outside, you wouldn't know looking at it. It looks like a normal rocket. It's just inside, there's a few tweaks and optimizations and refinements and rethinking of things that make it a bit more elegant and suitable for that class of vehicle. Just that specific micro launcher class. Was there, a, was, there a, uh, was there a pool of expertise that knew about propane and, and the use of propane that you tapped into? Or Not really, it? no. I, it's our CTO uh, came up with the idea, I think. Uh, uh, I would credit him with the idea, although lots of other people have added to it in, in the meantime. Um, and, and I don't think there's very much literature on propane. It certainly hasn't been used in spaceflight, to our, to our knowledge. I mean, there are, there are some early studies on the combustion properties of propane from NASA way back when... Um, but in terms of modern literature, we, we, don't, we think we're kind of writing the story there at the moment. And we love that it's Calagas because it's taking us back to the 70s <laughs> of when we had barbecues yeah. and, and camels. Well, yeah. 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 it, is, it, is, it is. And, you know, it's for, for Calor, I think it's quite an aspirational thing because, yeah. you know, they're associated with heating and, and camping. And now they're, you know, um, they're transporting mankind's dreams to the stars. And, Fantastic. And right, it's a nice story. Yeah. So is the reason why we're re-looking at things like propane is the fact that, that launchers are getting smaller because satellites are getting smaller. Is that, is that the, one of the sort of driving factors of that? Well, we, for, we, a, company, a small company can't build you know, an Ariane 5 or an Ariane 6. Mm. You know, the, the capital needed is ridiculous. Uh, even SpaceX started with a small launcher. I know where it is now. Right? Now, we don't have ambitions to be SpaceX, but you know, there's a certain scale that fits in a hall of that size mm. that's, that's doable with a certain amount of millions and without you know, nation-state kind of coffers. Um, and that's, I think, what drives that. But it just so happens there's a market demand for small satellite launch that is not being served by the big launchers. And, and there are really good reasons for that. Um, it, 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 honestly, people talk about this sector as low cost, but that's not the driver. It's lack of availability that's the driver. Mm. That there is plenty of capacity on big launchers, but if you've got a $300 million communication satellite, you do not want a student CubeSat potentially spanging out and, and ruining it. Yeah. And, and they, they just say, no, even if there's spare capacity, I mean, people literally fly sand as ballast, literally, to avoid taking additional payloads. It's an expensive journey for the sand. Oh, yeah, I don't know what happens to it on the way down. Yeah. Little meteorites. This is it. Now, we wanted to ask a bit about um, the reusability mm. and the lack of space junk that yep. there will be with your rockets. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, in a very light, we, we don't talk, we, we, we've got we've done a lot of work on that, but we prefer not to talk about it because we think it's quite easy to copy. We've got a patent pending on it, but we still think it's easy to copy, so we prefer not to talk about it. Um, again, the challenge is you can't add a lot of mass because that eats directly into the payload mass. So how do you solve that challenge? How do you get reusability without adding legs and parachutes and all kinds of stuff? Mm. Well, we think we've, we've cracked that particular problem, or at least we've got a solution that looks like it works in, various aerodynamic studies and, and wind tunnel studies we've done, and we're at full-scale studies now of some of the components. And um, it, it, the, the trick for us is a soft landing on, on ocean. Um, you, it's easy to get the rocket back yeah. <laughs> into the ocean, but it might not be in one piece when it lands. That's, that's yeah. straightforward. Getting it back in one piece is the trick, and uh, creating that soft landing so you can recover and reuse at least some of the key subsystems. It might, we may not be able to reuse all of it, but we certainly we want to get the power pack back, the yeah. six pack. Um, so th that's the goal really, and, that's, and the design kind of requirement is the recovery of that engine pod. 
the tank, you know, is sort of, if we don't get it back or it gets dinged, we're not too concerned about that. But the engines are valuable. Yeah. So in terms of that, we saw obviously the prime, uh, the second stage yeah. is correct. The, the, so the, the booster part of it, presumably, all of the enti this entire rocket is all built by Orbex, inclu yes. including the engines themselves. Yes, and, absolutely. In fact, we're investing in, in um, 3D printing, metal 3D printing machines to do it all in-house right now. Yeah, that's a lot of money right there. Yeah, so where, where were, so where were the, the, the display model we just saw, which is presumably almost a working rocket? In yeah, all of the components on there are completely real, and some of them have, have been used live and tested live. Uh, flight computer, engine, thrust vectoring, the tanks, all of it's real. So where, where, were the, where was that 3D printed? So that, that particular engine was printed in Germany, yeah. uh, and we had to get export certificates to move the CAD files, and right. then export certificates to get the engine back. We had to get an export certificate to get the engine back here. So we have to watch out for our export control laws, even in Europe. Um, and ultimately, the, the engines were produced in Denmark. And te we have an engine test site in Denmark as well, where we fire the engines up. And um, you know, yeah. we're looking at another engine test site here locally as well to do six-pack testing. Is that where the wind tunnels and everything else are? <clears throat> no, the wind tunnels in the UK. I, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say who did that, because I think we have an NDA. So, I, But it was a, a very professional hypersonic wind tunnel in the UK. Can we go in and try that ourselves? That sounds fun. I could put you in touch. I, I wouldn't say we work with that guy, but I know a man who's got one. No, sure, sure, sure. I wouldn't, I wouldn't confirm or deny if we worked with that guy, but I know a man who's got one. Fantastic. Uh, that, that you've thrown my train of thought now. Oh, it just looked too much fun in my head. Reuse we were talking about, I think. Oh, yeah, and yeah. and there's the other, you had another part to your reuse question, I think. Yeah, right? well, it was, the, it, it was the 3D. So the 3D printed, the la which, which is the largest. You said it was we, the largest. It's the largest just, single, just single piece. Yeah. yeah, and and so that's actually been fired as well as a as a rocket engine, isn't it? Uh, I don't know the current status, but that's not the only engine we've got like that. Right. And some of them are in different stages of development. Um, if you looked on that version down there, you would have noticed a helium loop. Did you see the loop going around yeah. the? So that that's a, a helium heat exchanger for heating helium to pressurize the the tanks. Um, in in the latest versions of the engine, that's built in to the three D printing version of it. So we're refining things so because you can do it, right? Yeah. It's, why not print it? Yeah. There's no extra real time or material involved and it saves a lot of complexity later. So we're doing refinements like that now um, and firing them up. Do the engines have a name? No. Like, they don't? Oh, no. Because we like things like Prometheus. The Interplanetary <laughs> Podcast engine. <laughs> the Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's too much like a, true. Too much like a Mars lander. We, um, I don't know. We're very low ego on that front. I mean, we could have named it after a famous physicist or something, but um, they've already got lots of stuff named after them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so. never mind. <laughs> so, um, I, in, in the, this morning, I was doing some research for today, and I watched a YouTube video about Orbex. And really? <laughs> the first comment was somebody moaning about how this should launches should be closer to the equator. Yeah. Now, now we know that this comes up a lot, but once and for all, can we can we say why that's invalid? Yeah. Well, we've got a video for that that we put out today as part of our, our media pack, and you'll find an unbranded version of that if you want to put it on your on your website. So, um, if you want to to go to equatorial or transfer orbits, the equator is a great place to launch from. But we don't want to go there. Hmm. We want to go pole to pole, and our customers want to go pole to pole. Uh, why do they want to go pole to pole? Because as you go in a plane from pole to pole and the Earth spins underneath you, you can cover the entire planet in a few days. So if you're doing Earth observation or communications, that's what you want. If you go equatorial, you can't do that. So for our purposes, for our needs, launching from Scotland to the north or perhaps from the Azores to the south um, into sun synchronous or polar orbits is exactly what we need. And so... For certain types of launches, um, the equator is irrelevant. Yeah. And that's, that's the case for us. I don't think that will kill it. That question will come up forever and ever, yeah. but, but, but um, that's my attempt to kill it. Well, yes. We're going to help promote that. Message. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Sutherland's not the only launch no. uh, site for Orbex. What, well, what? So, so Sutherland is still has to go through planning permission, which we, we think it, it's got a good chance of getting. Um, I think there's really strong support from the Scottish government and uh, Highlands Alliance Enterprise and various other parties, um, but it still has to get through planning uh, and then be built. Um, so to mitigate our commercial risk, because we're a commercial organisation, we, you know, I, I get fired if we don't launch and make money, right? So um, we're, we've also been shortlisted for the Azores uh, launch site, 
and we're working with another uh, site in Norway um, to see what we can do there. In fact, I think we've, we've moved forward a few steps of that in the past few days. But, so there's, there's two parts to that. One is to mitigate the risk of Sutherland not proceeding. Hopefully it will. I mean, that's what, that's what we'd like. But if it doesn't, I need to have a, a, other plans. And if it does, then we've got other options for capacity because um, you do hear some bizarre volume calculations from very exuberant parties out there saying they're going to be launching twice a minute or whatever. <laughs> um, but we, we, we're a bit more conservative. We think we'll be launching roughly once a month. And, and some of the months in the year you won't be able to launch because of weather or whatever or, or technical issues. So we think 10 to 12 launches a year from a single site is about the limit. And therefore, if you want to launch 36 or 48 a year, I think you see it now with Rocket Lab. They're expanding to other launch sites, right? The wallops and what have you. Um, you just need it for capacity. Have there been many concerns from the locals about these launches? Honestly, I, I've spent a lot of time up there. I was up there earlier this week. The overwhelming, and I mean 90% plus of people are highly positive about this launch site. There, there is a small group of, of people who are very loud, but there's a really a handful of people, I think, who are um, very set against it. And uh, my personal point of view, the first question I ever asked when I went up to Sutherland it's a really beautiful place. And I said to them, are you sure you would like a spaceport here? And, and the local people surprised me with their answer, which was that they felt their community was at risk of dying because there was no economic opportunity for kids to stay there. The schools were closing, the bank had closed, and, the, and their way of life was under threat. So they were looking for economic opportunity. And given the footprint of this, um, which when you, I can show you an image later, if you, if you take the footprint of like the Mahia launch complex in New Zealand and you put it on the Moyne, it's, it's like a dot. Mm. You know, it's really, it's, it's, they literally have a rubbish tip on the moin that's bigger. And if it's once a month, yeah, it's not yeah. too in your face, is it? Well, I mean, you know, we, we I, I think there are people with genuine concerns and, and they should definitely be heard mm -hmm. and those concerns should be mitigated, uh, no question. We, we want to, I've often said, you know, we want to be a member of that community because there's a fair chance some of my engineers will be marrying locally at some point down the line. Sure. So we don't really want to be an, an enemy of the local yeah. community. We want to be part of the local community. And that, that means listening to everybody and trying to sort of um, accommodate all views and uh, wherever possible. Um, but it's not up to me whether that launch site goes ahead or not. That's a planning process. There, there, are, there are other parties involved. I'm not even directly responsible for it. That's High's project, not mine. I built launchers. Yeah. Um, so I, hope it, I really hope it goes ahead because it'd be great. I've got one last question, and that's and that's to do with really what you said earlier on about the, the there isn't really the the launch vehicles at the moment for 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 that for this for this small satellite mm. mar market, but there does seem to be an awful lot of them in the pipeline. Yeah. Is 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 that a major concern, or do you actually thrive on that competition, or or or, or see see yourselves actually ahead, a little bit ahead of the pack? Um, well, I so this comes back to being silent. Um, so there are an awful lot of parties, groups, organizations out there who say they want to build a small launcher, probably more than 100 now. But if you start filtering on who's got the money, who's got the experience, who's got the access to facilities and resources, um, who has a nice desk like this, <laughs> um, you quickly filter down to a handful of companies globally, globally. A lot of those are in the USA. I mean, there are obvious candidates like Firefly and... Um, <laughs> I wouldn't put Vector in that class yet. They yeah. haven't done, we'll see. Um, <laughs> um, Virgin Orbit, yeah. very serious, I think. And Rocket Lab, obviously, have, set, have, have trailblazed the, the entire sector. I mean, I, kudos to Rocket Lab. I have great respect for everything that, that Peter Beck's done there. Really awesome. And um, I wish them all the success in the world, really. The Rocket Lab, I'm a, almost a fanboy of what they've done there, <laughs> yeah. to be honest. Um, but then if you look in Europe, I think in Europe, we are, we are certainly um, one of the leading companies, if not the leading company now. Um, and then in China, there are two or three companies that are coming along, um, like Landspace and OneSpace and these kind of companies. But certainly within Europe, I think we've got a niche that we can create for a European launch that um, where I think we're, we're a very strong, very strong position and, and possibly a leader. And, um, and that's my goal, is a European um, launch capability. I, I don't really care too much about the American market, to be honest. It's yeah. not, not really in focus. <laughs> exactly. Now, I wanted to ask something just outside of Orbex. What's the most exciting thing for you in 2019 that is penciled in? A holiday would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to get one of them. No, yeah. you're absolutely right. No chance. Um, <laughs> um, I look forward to Saturday and Sunday because I can get my work done. <laughs> Let's think. Um, 
Well, we've, we've got some news this week that we're not, not announced today that's quite good, I think. Well, we'll come up with that a little bit later on. Okay. Um, there's, there's, you, know, you know, small things make us smile in all bits. It's really interesting. We're not really so impressed by the, the hype and the big stuff. In, in, honestly, this company is very low ego. Um, and, and it's really productive. It's one of the few companies I've been in where there aren't these kind of political um, fights going on. It's very uh, collegiate. People work very well together and we get stuff done because we focus on on the real work that moves the company forward and not kind of, you know, the ego moments. And, and this today is very unusual for Wix, really it is. And I don't think we'll do another one for a while. Mm. Um, um, but the core focus is building a rocket that will go to orbit. That's the thing we have to do. Because without that, what do we got? Some carbon fiber and some metal. <laughs> and, that's, and, and probably it's not very valuable at that point either. Yeah. Mm. So the focus is get to orbit, um, get the resources in place to do that. We're, we're growing. Um, People, resources, facilities like this, um, support customers now as well. That, that today for me was the most impressive part of the day, that customers are willing to sign up with us three years ahead of a launch for a rocket that, that, that best only half exists. Right? <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. So that, yeah. that's actually, for me, our, our head of sales, Jan Skolny, has done an excellent job there. That speaks volumes. So where can our listeners go to get more information about um, Orbex and the future? Yeah, well, uh, our Twitter feed, um, Orbex Space, at Orbex Space is one word, or uh, www.orbex.space, not .com. Um, very modern and <laughs> newfangled. Half my emails don't get through the email <laughs> service with that dot .space on the end. Um, that's where you can find out most things. And then, uh, you know, listening to great podcasts, yes. oh, like the Interplanetary talking. Podcast, which I listen to oh, religiously. <laughs> <laughs> I, went, I, was, I was terrified coming up the stairs because you said that we were slightly disparaging after Farnborough, but I can't, I can't remember what we said. I well, I think, I think you looked at it and said, you know, uh, this company, well, I think every, I, Scott Manley has also been a little bit kind of skeptical. I think that's perfectly fair, right? You know, we're, we're a very young company and not much is known about us and we keep fairly quiet. So if you look at the website, it's, the, you know, it's a few renderings and what have you yeah. but it's deliberate that we keep quiet so we have a few small rules in the company um, I won't go to all of them but um, uh, quite often you hear the engineers talk about rule three can I swear on your podcast yeah you can okay. yeah. Um, so rule three is don't fuck it up that works. Um, now, now the, what, what does that mean in real terms it means we've been given a great opportunity here people are entrusting us with money and resources and opportunity um, the chance probably of a lifetime to do this, that many people would die to do, mm. give their right arms to be doing. Don't fuck it up. You won't get a second shot. Do your job. We depend on each other. I do my job, you do your job. I don't need to be checking you twice. That, that is an ethos here. And you will be in engineering meetings and you'll hear people say rule three and the room will stop and think about what's just, what they need to think about mm. under rule three. It happens day, day after day, it's weird. Mm. We need to start saying that to each other. Yeah, we, we, especially I, I, with recording. What on earth is rule one and rule two? Well, I, 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 I can tell you, I mean, rule one is no jail time. Because when I got into this, I didn't know much about the sector, but I quickly figured out there were export controls rules that could put the CEO in jail. So I, rule one was no jail time. We, okay. If there's a law, we're going to follow it. And we're going to get legal advice to figure out what the rules are that apply. And we're going to make sure that for the filling out of a form, nobody's doing, you know, 10 years in pokey. That's a different kind of holiday. <laughs> yeah. So that was a very early rule. If the rules kind of evolved over time. But rule three is, the, is, the, is like the, the high runner. Rule two is another, another one entirely. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I like the way you're deciding whether to tell us rule, rule more, two. More swearing involved in rule two, probably. <laughs> we'll get you a couple of drinks. We'll ask you again in the morning. Yeah, it's not that bad, but I just, I, I, you know, I'll keep something for next time. Yeah, oh, that'd be brilliant. We might be we'll, on rule we'll, four by next time. Yeah, we could have a, we could have a rule two special. We could do <laughs> rule two special. Yeah, yeah. Quite like that. Well, thank you so much for your time. We know you're a busy man. No and problem. We wish you all the luck in the world. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I really appreciate. Exciting. I really appreciate your interest, and I, I, I have to say, your podcast is. Um, I've listened to several episodes, not just oh, the one wow. looking at us. And uh, there was one, um, it was a two-part, and it was looking at reaction engines, if I remember yeah, correctly. Alan Bond, That's yeah. right, Alan yeah. Bond. That was super fascinating to listen yeah. to. Thank you for letting yeah, us. Yeah, no problem at all. Yeah. Always welcome. Right. Thank you. Well, whenever we're opening the doors, you're welcome. We don't open them that often, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, make yeah. the most of it while you're here. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank right. you very much. You're welcome. Awesome. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. The Interplanetary Podcast is alive! I got an extremely good vibe off Chris Lamore. I think he is just the man to launch Orbex into the stratosphere. Yeah, excellent, I, I, excellent job, and and what a cool guy. 
Yeah, I really like that whole um, modest approach. I can't believe they haven't got a name for the engines. Like, everyone names their engine something. Well, I like that he asked us if he could swear. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't had that before. That's, that's no, brilliant. No, he's, no. Yeah, he's, he's bringing good. some rock and roll to the podcast, some much-needed grit. So, Matt, not only did we just have that awesome interview with Chris Lamour, we now have an interview with the head of the UK Space Agency, Mr. Graham Turnock, um, yeah. who is also a lovely bloke. And uh, I think he had some good things to say. So, should we have a listen? Do it. Ecoute. We're here at the Orbex launch of their new facility, and yeah. uh, they surprised us with a, a nice reveal of their prime rocket. Um, are you excited about the UK space industry as it is now in terms of it's obviously getting some momentum, isn't it? Goodness, how could you not be excited uh, after what we've just seen? Unfortunately, this is audio, but I hope you'll be able to put up a photo of the, the Stage 2 rocket that we've just looked at. I mean, I grew up in the, the 70s. We had the Americans doing everything in those days. The space shuttle was starting to come on stream. Uh, and just for the fact that we are now doing launch from the UK alongside all our other achievements on communications, uh, satellites, etc., is just astonishingly exciting. Yeah, really excited. Obviously, amongst space geeks, we, we, we're suddenly very excited, particularly since Farnborough and the announcements there. Uh, uh, but it's, it, is it a message that you think has got out to the, to the wider general public, or do you think there's actually a hell of a lot of work to actually do there? Well, I mean, in some ways, the whole Galileo debate last year, I think, shone a very positive light on the UK space sector. I think people woke up to the fact that it was important and the UK had real strengths in it. Of course, we've had Tim Peake and his his flight on the space station. I think that really made a big impact as well. So I think we're doing pretty well, actually. And the publication of our Science and Health report last week, which showed how strongly the UK space sector is growing, I think is another you know, thing that people will have picked up. So, so I hope we're making that impact. Obviously, people will think of NASA uh, immediately when they think of space, but I hope they're starting to think about the European uh, and the UK space agencies as well. And we were, we were hearing earlier about the extra jobs that's going to be coming to the UK and, of course, Scotland. Um, what, do you, what do you think it would look like in 50 years' time of the changes that might have happened? Wow, 50 years, that's a long way ahead. I mean, we tend to think about 10 years ahead. And in, over the next 10 years, we're really looking to build the space sector by another 30,000 jobs. So we're currently at about 40,000 jobs. I mean, in 50 years' time, I guess things like suborbital spaceflight will become, you know, like going to Malaga is today. You know, there'll be kind of hen nights and stag nights doing it. And I'm sure, you know, we will have a lot of satellites in orbit doing just amazing things and making us an even more connected world than we are currently. And who knows, you know, we may have humans on Mars in 50 years' time. So, you know, that's, that's an amazingly exciting, says. exciting <laughs> prospect, isn't it? And, and how important is it about the um, announcements of, of the green energy? So the, the um, biopropane mm. and the lighter rockets, therefore becoming more efficient and... How important is that to the sector? Well, I think it's important for two reasons. I mean, one, because, you know, the commercial launch sector, I think, is going to be quite competitive. And if you can be um, lighter and more efficient, you've got an edge there. You'll be able to offer launch uh, at a reduced, more competitive rate. But also, clearly, environmental uh, matters are to the forefront of uh, everybody's minds. And, you know, biopropane uh, is a very environmentally friendly fuel. And therefore, you know, that's going to make it a lot easier when it comes to things like environmental impact assessments from the launch site. So I think it's really positive. From a government perspective, is it is it really sort of uh, is the main priority now sort of carving out legislation and, and getting the legislation right for the for the UK space launch? So I think really important that we got the Space Industries Act through um, uh, earlier in the year, and we're now very much looking to turn that into hands-on regulation. So the companies and the spaceport will be needing to get licenses and we're putting in place the team that will be able to provide those licenses to them. So yeah, that's really important. We see it one of the ba major advantages of the UK that we've got really a world leading regulatory environment, support launch and other space activities. So at the moment, we've got the, t the, the sort of two main uh, launch centers as Sutherland and down in spaceport Cornwall. Um, <laughs> Are there, other, are there going to be others coming online? And, and which do you think is going to be the first to actually get an orbital launch up? 
Um, well, I think Spaceport um, Sutherland is obviously extremely well placed. Uh, it's got funding in place. Um, we're supporting it. And um, it's obviously got Lockheed Martin Norbex looking very much to launch from it. So I think it's in prime position. But obviously, as you've mentioned, there are there are sites looking uh, to do horizontal launch. Um, there are also sites in Scotland like Campbelltown and Prestwick that are looking to do horizontal as well. And um, there are others that are interested in vertical. So, I mean, from our perspective, we're just so pleased that so many people are looking to do launch in so many different ways from the UK. Would you say there's anywhere specific that some of our listeners can go to if they're interested about getting into the space sector, maybe working in engineering or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, if you just want a great day out and you want to engage with the space sector, I'd say go to Leicester, go to the National Space Centre there. You can see Blue Streak, you can see, you know, a British rocket, uh, and you can find out a huge amount about space or go to the um, go to the Science Museum. It's got a really great space gallery there as well. I mean, obviously, if you're a young person, you want to get into space, then start looking at opportunities to do secondments. There are some really good websites out there. Space Careers, which was started by somebody who's now working for us in the space agency is a really good website with lots of tips there. Thank you very much. We won't waste any more of your time. Well, yeah. it's a pleasure. Thank, thank you very no, much for, uh, yes, for taking time out of your drink to speak to us. Thank you. <laughs> good to, nice to speak to you. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Exciting times for the UK space uh, scene, isn't it? Uh, do you know what? I think possibly the greatest thing about it is that they announced that they're going to be working with Surrey Satellites. So not only... Yeah did I make the journey from Guildford to uh, Orbex the other day. So will, one of the, so will the first launch do exactly the same journey as I made. But the really exciting part about it is that it will be a monumental uh, first. It's going to be UK's end-to-end -end launch capability with a UK rocket launching a UK satellite from a UK spaceport. It's just it speaks volumes about where we are in the global community, uh, and long may it continue. It's really exciting times, isn't it? Absolutely. So, Jamie, over the next three or four years, I do expect us to go down and see a launch down in Cornwall and go to a launch in Scotland. I think now, it's going to happen. Can you imagine even? Can you imagine saying that four years ago that it would have absolutely not... was unheard of. And for those worrying about Brexit, by the way, I did mm. read from another interview from uh, that night that um, uh, this is what Chris said about Brexit. He said, Brexit doesn't change the fact that Scotland is an excellent location to launch from. We are looking at what Brexit might mean from the business point of view, but we don't plan to leave Britain and go to Luxembourg, for example. Hopefully, it will be resolved in an elegant way and not be a huge problem. There we go. Um, I'll tell you what I'd like to do, Matt. Um, before we leave uh, the listeners to get on with their weekend, I would like to say a massive, and I can't overstate this enough, a massive thank you to our wonderful, handsome, beautiful patrons who made our Orbex trip happen. We literally couldn't have gone without your donations. Uh, it meant that we got a little... Airbnb in Forres. We were very close to each other. Matt snores a lot, but it made the trip happen. We we, we were able to afford our flights and we got it, great interviews. So we want to say that, that you made that happen and thank you. Genuinely. We eked out every single penny of the Patreon money to, to get, make it go as far as it possibly could. And that we thought was one of the best ways we could have possibly have spent it and we do totally appreciate the support that's just yeah you genius. made that you guys made that happen and if, genuinely made that happen and if you want to uh join this elite team of legends uh where can people go matt it's www.interplanetary.org.uk or www.patreon.com forward slash interplanetary Matt, are there any extra benefits from being a Patreon? Depending on, you know, which scale you go on, you might get a, you might get your T-shirt, you might get your mug, but you also get the odd super bonus bit of interview material that we haven't used on the show and, and you get uh, to join our Discord. And, you know, if you go completely all out, you get to uh, choose the direction of the show. O-M-G. 
Jamie, we should say goodbye because it's been a long podcast. This has been long. We, we, we love you. Have a great Valentine's Day. Stay safe. See you soon. Bye, Spodcats. Bye. See ya. Bye. Bye.